Chapter One Halfway up the shining surface of the gilt-framed pier glass was a mark, a tiny ink line that had been carefully drawn across the outer edge of the wide bevel. As Gwendolyn stared at the line, the reflection of her small face in the mirror grew suddenly all white, as if some rude hand had reached out and brushed away the pink from cheeks and lips. Arms rigid at her sides, and open palms pressed hard against the flaring skirts of her riding coat, she shrank back from the glass. Ooh! she breathed aghast. The gray eyes swam. After a moment, however, she blinked resolutely to clear her sight, stepped forward again, and, straightening her slender little figure to its utmost height, measured herself a second time against the mirror. But, as before, the top of her yellow head did not reach above the ink mark, not by the smallest part of an inch. So there was no longer any reason to hope. The worst was true. She had drawn the tiny line across the edge of the bevel the evening before, when she was only six years old. Now it was mid-morning of another day, and she was seven. Yet she was not a whit taller. The tears began to overflow. She pressed her embroidered handkerchief to her eyes. Then, stifling a sob, she crossed the nursery, stumbling once or twice as she made toward the long cushioned seat that stretched the whole width of the front window. There, among the down-filled pillows, with her loose hair falling about her wet cheeks and screening them, she lay down. For months she had looked forward with secret longing to this seventh anniversary. Every morning she had taken down the rose-embossed calendar that stood on the top of her golden-white writing-desk, and tallied off another of the days that intervened before her birthday. And the previous evening she had measured herself against the pier-glass without even a single misgiving. She rose at an early hour. Her waking look was toward the pier-glass. Her one thought was to gauge her new height. But the morning was the usual busy one. When Jane finished bathing and dressing her, Miss Royal summoned her to breakfast. An hour in the schoolroom followed, an hour of quiet study, but under the watchful eye of the governess. Next, Gwendolyn changed her dressing gown for a riding habit, and with Jane holding her by one small hand, and with Thomas following, stepped into the bronze cage that dropped down so noiselessly from nursery floor to wide entrance hall. Outside, the limousine was waiting. She and Jane entered it. Thomas took his seat beside the chauffeur, and in a moment the motor was speeding away. At the riding school her master gave her the customary lesson. She circled the tan-bark on her fat brown pony, now to the right at a walk, now to the left at a trot, now back to the right again at a rattling canter, with her yellow hair whipping her shoulders and her three-cornered hat working farther and farther back on her bobbing head and tugging hard at the elastic under her dimpled chin. After nearly an hour of this walk, trot, and canter, she was very rosy, and quite out of breath. Then she was put back into the limousine, and driven swiftly home. And it was not until after her arrival that she had a moment entirely to herself, and the first opportunity of comparing her height with the tiny ink line on the edge of the mirror's bevel. Now as she lay, face down on the window seat, she knew how vain had been all the longing of months. The realization, so sudden and unexpected, was a blow. The slender little figure among the cushions quivered under it. But all at once she sat up, and disappointment and grief gave place to apprehension. "'I wonder what's the matter with me,' she faltered aloud. "'Oh, something awful, I guess.' The next moment caution succeeded fear. She sprang to her feet and ran across the room. That tell-tale mark was still on the mirror, for nurse or governess to see and question, and it was advisable that no one should learn the unhappy truth. Her handkerchief was damp with tears. She gathered the tiny square of linen into a tight ball and rubbed at the ink-line industriously. She was not a moment too soon. Scarcely had she regained the window-seat when the hall-door opened and Thomas appeared on the sill almost filling the opening with his tall figure. As a rule he wore his very splendid footman's livery of dark blue coat with dull gold buttons, blue trousers, and striped buff waistcoat. Now he wore street clothes, and he had a leash in his hand. 
"'Is Jane about, Miss Gwendolen?' he inquired. Then, seeing that Gwendolen was alone, "'Would you mind telling her when she comes "'that I'm out taking the madam's dogs for a walk?' Gwendolen had a new thought. "'A... a walk?' she repeated, and stood up. "'But tell Jane, if you please,' continued he, "'that I'll be back in time to go... well, she knows where.' This was said significantly. He turned. "'Thomas!' Gwendolen hastened across to him. "'Wait till I put on my hat. I'm... I'm going with you.' Her riding hat lay among the dainty pink and white articles on her crystal-topped dressing-table. She caught it up. "'Miss Gwendolen!' exclaimed Thomas, astonished. "'I'm seven, declared Gwendolen, struggling with the hat elastic. "'I'm a whole year older than I was yesterday, and... and I'm grown up.' An exasperating smile lifted Thomas's lip. "'Oh, are you?' he observed. The hat settled, she met his look squarely. Did he suspicion anything? Yes. And you take the dogs out to walk, so, she started to pass him, I'm going to walk. His hair was black and straight. Now it seemed fairly to bristle with amazement. I couldn't take you if you was grown up, he asserted firmly, blocking her advance. Leastways, not without Miss Royal or Jane say yes. It'd be worth my job. Gwendolen lowered her eyes, stood a moment in indecision, then pulled off the hat, tossed it aside, went back to the window, and sat down. At one end of the seat, swung high on its gilded spring, danced the dome-topped cage of her canary. Presently she raised her face to him. He was traveling tirelessly from perch to cage floor, from floor to trapeze again. His wings were half-lifted from his little body, the bright yellow of her own hair. It was as if he were ready for flight. His round black eyes were constantly turned toward the world beyond the window. He perked his head inquiringly, and cheeped. Now and then, with a wild beating of his pinions, he sprang sideways to the shining bars of the cage, and hung there panting. She watched him for a time, made a slow survey of the nursery next, and sighed. "'Poor thing,' she murmured. She heard the rustle of silk skirts from the direction of the schoolroom. Hastily she shook out the embroidered handkerchief and put it against her eyes. A door opened. "'There will be no lessons this afternoon, Gwendolen.' It was Miss Royal's voice. Gwendolen did not speak, but she lowered the handkerchief a trifle, and noted that the governess was dressed for going out, in a glistening black silk plentifully ornamented with jet paillettes. Miss Royal rustled her way to the pier-glass to have a last look at her bonnet. It was a poke, with a quilted ribbon circling its brim, and some lace arranged fluffily. It did not reach many inches above the spot where Gwendolen had drawn the ink-line, for Miss Royal was small. When she had given the poke a pat here and a touch there, she leaned forward to get a better view of her face. She had a pale, thin face and thin, faded hair. On either side of a high bony nose were set her pale blue eyes. Shutting them in, and perched on the thinnest part of her nose, were silver-circled spectacles. "'I'm very glad I can give you a half-holiday, dear,' she went on. But her tone was somewhat sorrowful. She detached a small leaf of paper from a tiny book in her handbag, and rubbed it across her forehead. "'For my neuralgia is much worse to-day.' She coughed once or twice behind a lyle-gloved hand, snapped the clasp of her handbag, and started toward the hall door. It was now that for the first time she looked at Gwendolen, and caught sight of the bowed head, the grief-flushed cheeks, the suspended handkerchief. She stopped short. "'Gwendolen!' she exclaimed, annoyed. "'I hope you're not going to be cross and troublesome, and make it impossible for me to have a couple of hours to myself this afternoon.' "'especially when I'm suffering.' "'Then, coaxingly, "'you can amuse yourself with one of your nice pretend games, dear.' "'From under long, up-curling lashes, "'Gwendolen regarded her in silence. "'I've planned to lunch out,' went on Miss Royal. "'But you won't mind, will you, dear Gwendolen?' "'Plaintively. "'For I'll be back at tea-time. "'And besides,' growing brighter, "'you're to have, what do you think, "'the birthday cake cook is made.' "'I hate cake!' burst out Gwendolen, and covered her eyes once more. 
"'Gwendolen!' breathed Miss Royal. Gwendolen sat very still. "'How can you be so naughty? "'Oh, it's really wicked and ungrateful of you "'to be fretting and complaining, "'you who have so many blessings. "'But you don't appreciate them "'because you've always had them.' "'Well,' mournfully solicitous, "'I trust they'll never be taken from you, my child. "'Ah, oh, I know how bitter such a loss is. "'I haven't always been in my present circumstances "'compelled to go out among strangers to earn a scant living. "'Once—' "'Here she was interrupted. "'The door from the schoolroom swung wide with a bang. "'Gwendolen, looking up, saw her nurse. "'Jane was in sharp contrast to Miss Royal. "'Taller and stocky, with broad shoulders and big arms.' As she halted against the open schoolroom door, her hair was as ruddy as the panel that made a background for it, and she had reddish eyes and a full round face. In the midst of her face, and all out of proportion to it, was her short, turned-up nose, which was plentifully sprinkled with freckles. "'So, you're going out,' she began angrily, addressing the governess. Miss Royal retreated a step. "'Just for a—a a couple of hours,' she explained. Jane's face grew almost as red as her hair. Slamming the schoolroom door behind her, she advanced. "'I suppose it's the neuralgia again,' she suggested with quiet heat. The color stole into Miss Royal's pale cheeks. She coughed. "'It is a little worse than usual this afternoon,' she admitted. "'I thought so,' said Jane. "'It's always worse. On bargain days.' "'How dare you!' "'You ask me that, do you, you old snake in the grass?' Now Jane grew pallid with anger. Gwendolen, listening, contemplated her governess thoughtfully. She had often heard her pronounced a snake in the grass. Miss Royal was also pale. "'That will do,' she declared. "'I shall report you to Madam.' "'Report!' echoed Jane, giving a loud, harsh laugh and shaking her hair, the huge pompadour in front, the pug behind. "'Well, go ahead, and I'll report you and your handy neuralgia.' "'It's your duty to look after Gwendolen when there are no lessons,' reminded Miss Royal, but weakening noticeably. "'On weekdays?' shrilled Jane. "'Oh, don't try to fool me with any of your scheming. I see, and I just laugh in my sleeve.' Gwendolen fixed inquiring gray eyes upon that sleeve of Jane's dress, which was the nearer. It was of black sateen. It fitted the stout arm sleekly. 